morning, everybody. Grab your coffee. It's time for Living with Favor, where we talk about faith, abundance, vitality, overflow, and relationships. I'm Lisa Mosby, your host of Living with Favor. Thank you so much for tuning in and letting me share a bit of advice. Hello, everybody. Grab your coffee. It's time for Living with Favor. Um, I'm your host, Lisa Mosby. Um, Thank you so much for tuning in and letting me share a bit of advice. You know, today we're talking about the importance of fellowship and building a supportive community. And my guests include Becky Sheehan. Becky's been with me before. We've done a couple of other series, but she's an empathic, intuitive healer, specializing in human design, and she's a relationship coach. Becky brings a wealth of knowledge and experience in fostering deep, authentic connections. And that's why I wanted her in on this conversation. And then my other guest, Rhiannon, is new here. She hasn't been here. We'll do a one-to-one with her, so she gets all the time. But she, too, is a community, I want to say a community organizing expert, the way she brings people together. She's the founder and CEO of Aurora Consulting, LLC. And Rhiannon is a multi-talented, results-driven leader for her innovative leadership and professional, she's known for her innovative leadership and professional excellence. So welcome, ladies. I'm so glad that both of you are here with us today. Thank you for having us. My pleasure. My pleasure. You know, before we get started and I get to hear your definitions of fellowship, I wanted to bring this around um, for for the audience members, for the people who are listening in. Why fellowship? That's kind of an interesting word. It sounds like an old fashioned word, something you think of, you know, as an associate for a hospital or fellowship at church. Uh, But I this series is called The Five Elements of Life, and they are um, easy for me to remember because there's five of them. You know, I, I've gleaned this from Tony Robbins and other folks who use their their 10 their ten areas of focus or their seven areas of focus. I am simpler. I need to keep things down to, you know, manageable. That's why FAVOR has an acronym and it's just five letters. Faith always being the first one whenever I use an acronym. And then this is five elements of life is faith. It is fitness. It is fellowship, finance, and fun. Everything has to be fun in my life, or I just can't seem to get myself motivated to do it. And so we're talking about that fellowship element. And the way that I define fellowship for this is I'm pulling together both relationships and community. So Fellowship is a friendly association, especially with people who have shared interests. They value fun and good fellowship as the foundation of community. That's how I pull together this definition. And I'm going to throw it over to you, Rhiannon. And how do you define fellowship? When I invited you to do this show, what kind of came to mind for you? Um, a deep sense of connection um, and purpose. So amongst other individuals, like being in the space with all of you, like who are like-minded, who are on this journey of a deep sense of connection and purpose um, and like mutual growth um, and community life. And um, I get feedback a lot about you're a community type of person, like you love community. And I'm like, community is everything. It's how I get through life. I don't know how I'd get through life without it. So fellowship, I feel like is a very important pillar as part of life, you know? I agree wholeheartedly. I know that I couldn't have done the last couple of years without the communities that I'm part of. So I totally appreciate that definition. How about you, Becky? Fellowship. What does it mean to you? Uh, fellowship. Um, well, the first thing that comes into my mind, of course, is community. I, um, but I think it's, 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 you know, whenever there's a gathering really of a group of individuals that that have something in common like they have whether it be an interest whether it be a belief whether it be a purpose whether it be a mission or something like everybody's sort of gathering together they find this commonality and they're able to really come through with a lot of support with a lot of wisdom with a lot of insight and and it's when a group of people can really come and just uplift each other and and pour into each other and serve each other in in a really beautiful, authentic sort of way. That's what I look at when I think about fellowship. I think there's a lot of love, a lot of support, a lot of uplifting, a lot of great advice. And we everybody wants to see everybody else really sort of thrive, be in their element, feel great about who they are and what it is that they're doing and what it is that they have to share and give. And, you know, walk away and, and just feeling like you are the special, perfect, beautiful human being that you were created to be. 
<laughs> when uh, the things that I'm hearing both of you say, it's it's kind of a, um, a camaraderie. You know, if you're not in a community that lifts you up, that, that makes you get out of bed in the morning, um, we're all part of the Morning Rush community for, you know, those listening in. Um, everyone is welcome to the Morning Rush community. It's a free community for uh, busy executives who are heart-centered leaders and want to come together every morning, Monday through Friday for support and tools and growth and having conversations that we don't have other places. And we integrate all cultures, all people. And so you get perspectives that you wouldn't necessarily get in your day-to-day -day life, in your job, or in, in the community that you live in. So we we reach around the globe through that organization. And I think community, in that community, what it does mostly for all of us is it lifts us up. There are no wrong answers. We get to listen to people's perspective. And so I want to know how does, or what role does fellowship within that community play in your mental health and your emotional well-being? Let's go there first. Who wants to start with this one. Go Rhiannon. <laughs> um, so it's really interesting that you say that. Um, I work remotely, which means that I work alone a lot. And then I started to realize it started to affect my mental health, where um, the isolation was really getting to me, even though I would be on the phone with people during the evening times. Um, so what I put in place was like, um, in connecting with other people's shared goals, um, in being in community, I started scheduling people to do work remotely sessions. So their days of the week, like Monday, Friday, I'm at my girlfriend, Samantha's house, and she works remotely with her job. So we get to be in community and be together or going in the morning at 7 a.m. and working out with the group that I've been working out with for five years. And I hadn't been able to show up for two years. And now I'm like showing up every morning at seven, Monday through Friday. And like, that's where I get all my hugs. That's where I get human interaction and the laughter and the joking. And when we're just like, oh, Jesus, that's, I can't get up. And they're like, man, I'll call Jesus, get up, more push-ups, more sit-ups. And we're laughing and we're like all all ages. And so that really starts my morning, like doing that. And then the morning rush and like, that's the fellowship. It like, it keeps my spirit going and I'm a social butterfly and we have to feed our souls. And I feel, I, I realize that it's the people in our lives that really feed our souls. It's their personalities. It's their laugh. It's the laughter they bring you. It's the joy they bring you. It's the embrace they bring you. Um, so that's what it brings me present to when you ask that. About you. Yeah, I think, you know, as far as the mental health aspect around fellowship, I mean, we all want to remember that we're not alone. <laughs> like whatever it is that we're experiencing and no matter where that sort of falls in the line of human emotion or or thought, you know, we're not alone there. We're not the only people that are, are sort of wrestling with those things. Right. We're not the only people that are really excited about something or really interested with things or or struggling with something or really want to elevate in some particular way. You know, we're not alone on that journey. And when you come into community with other people, when you start bringing other people in and really listening, there's almost like this, this, this sort of acceptance, right? There's this feeling of acceptance. There's this feeling, hopefully, <laughs> just taking this deep breath and just knowing like, okay, like I'm not you know, the odd person out. I'm not here all alone having this really unique experience. There's other people here that struggle with it. And there's other people here that I can lean on, that can support me, that I can talk to and sort of like suss things out with. And 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 I think that's so important because, you know, that's the key to mental health really is, you know, so much of mental health is just struggling with this feeling that, you know, you're the exception, you are alone, you're sort of like on this island, and it gets really, really lonely. And when you start to be in community with other people, um, and you start to recognize that, you know, there's a lot of people that can, can that can relate to you, there's a lot of people that might have like, so, like, you know, succeeded in all these areas that you are struggling with that can give you a lot advice that can give you hope that can give you a different perspective it's such an amazing beautiful feeling and and I think we all need that we need that so so much so that's sort of what I look at community and mental health as like just bringing together and mind us like we're not alone in all this yeah I've heard somebody say once that I was standing in a room full of people and I never felt more alone and I think that that there's truth to that is that there's this piece of us that 
especially as entrepreneurs working remotely by ourselves, exactly what you were talking about, Rhiannon, that, that there is a lot of alone time, but it doesn't mean that we are alone. There's a difference there. Like we can get in community with people and not feel alone and then go do our work, focus, head down uh, and, and be in that space by ourselves. But yet if we needed to reach out, if we needed to, to call someone, if we needed to email, text, there's so many ways that we can use technology to build community. So I want to go to technology in a second, but what are some challenges that people face developing fellowship? When someone says to me that I'm standing in a, a room full of people and I feel so alone, I feel like they're not connecting. They're not, they're not actually embracing that fellowship that's available to them. So how do we face the challenge or how do we overcome the challenge of the aloneness in our communities so that we integrate and we, we feel like we belong? Becky, I'm going to start with you this time. Oh yeah. This is something I've struggled with. So much in my adult life. I keep on saying it's so hard as an adult to make friends. Like it really, really is. I remember I moved to Bo um, to Boston at one point and I was trying so desperately just to make friends and I would talk to people and I felt like very shut out. I felt like there was just sort of like nobody was interested in talking to me. I felt a lot of judgments. Maybe they were coming from me. Maybe they were coming from them. Who's to say? But like, I, I felt, you know, even more awkward. And I think that this is a collective experience, especially amongst adults, that there is this sort of fear of really connecting with people and putting yourself out there and being vulnerable. And that's what it takes, really, to sort of make those connections and make fellowships. It takes two individuals that are willing to sort of bring down their walls and allow for somebody else to come in and experience and be in communication and to really listen to them and hear them. And that's, um, you know, oftentimes that could be a very tricky and difficult thing because not everybody is willing to do that on both sides. Not everybody is willing to sort of put themselves out there and potentially experience a fear, a feeling of rejection in some way, or a feeling that what they have to say or their energy or, or, anything that they be is insignificant to somebody else. Um, you know, that's, that's a fear. And, and, and um, unfortunately, as, as you know, the way that our society is like, everybody's sort of caught up in their own thing. Um, I think that we sort of gotten conditioned to really just be caught up in our own world and our own thing and our own mindset that we've forgotten what it is to really care about other people and to really value other people for being, you know, the individual beings that they are and to really allow other people to sort of come in and be able to enrich our lives in some way and capacity. Um, I get, I get joked around a lot for being like the ultra vulnerable person. Like I just sort of like, bleh, and like let everybody in. And it could be a lot for some people, but I do it very purposefully because I like to be the invitation for other people to know that they're safe with me. And if they need connection, if they need a place to talk, then I'm a safe space and I'm a safe person to talk. And I do that by showing them first just how open I am. And um, I think that, you know, for a really great community, you got to have a lot of individuals that are going to let down their walls and sort of just advertise in some way or form. Like, I'm a safe space. I'm open. You can have a conversation with me. Um I want to hear from you. And that creates this really sort of opportunity. Well, you'll get a lot of shy people that sort of just come on and talk to you. And I think that's an amazing gift. Whenever I, I'm in communication with somebody, then I, I can really sense that this is, you know, out of their comfort zone. I, I'm so grateful. Like this is a, this is a gift right here. The, just the fact that they're reaching out to me and are talking to me, that's a gift. And it's something that I don't take lightly. And it's something that I cherish very much. So I think vulnerability is really the key um, from both sides on really sort of making those connections and, and forming connect community and relationships. And unfortunately, not a lot of people feel safe to be vulnerable. When we're in those communities, we kind of have to step forward. You know, we need, like you said, you, you mm -hmm. show up and be vulnerable so that you welcome that. 
I think sometimes we just need to get one to one with people. When new pe new members come into the community, I know within our TMR group, there's Heather here who's in the audience today. Um, she reaches out to every single person individually, gets on a one to one call with them, and tells them kind of what we're all about and how they can integrate and gets to know them. And so she's that heart centered connection for people when they first enter into our community through the the morning rush. Uh, and I think seeing that in other communities, I know in my Bible study groups and in in other social communities, I do a lot of meetup communities because when I moved to Florida, I didn't know a soul. So I reach out to those folks. And there's always that leader, kind of like what you're talking about, Becky, where they kind of step up and they are that vulnerable person. So if you're in community, find that person. If you're someone who's struggling to actually make the connection, you're feeling alone in your communities, find that one individual that you can actually have a conversation with and connect with and maybe tear down that wall a little bit, or at least you know, open the door and kind of welcome someone into that space because we don't have to be alone. We have resources available to us and there's plenty of people on the planet to find a community that fits your needs and what it is that you're looking for. Rhiannon, how about you? How have you integrated into communities? Um, you know what? There's some things where I've, you know, a lot of, similar to what Becky said, but I'm going to add something here. Um, what came up for me is when there is a blockade being able to connect and be with people, there's an area to look at yourself for healing. We talked about our past experiences of rejection and how it impacts our life. And then you say to yourself, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to put myself out there again, you know, and then we get smaller and smaller and our lives get smaller and smaller. And so there is a, a responsibility we owe to ourselves to honor ourselves and know that we are worthy of being seen. And some people are afraid of being seen because of the rejection and maybe people seeing whatever they think they're seeing and not actually seeing them. And there's something about being seen um, that just keeps an individual or human being going. And, and, you know, in the midst of my own personal, these past two years, life looked very different than it looked when I was nationally fundraising for public education. I was in these positions and then all of a sudden I was a caretaker and all of a sudden I was like supporting family through emergencies and my life looked different, you know? Um, and I, and having those anchors or those people who saw me, who see all of me and not just the circumstance that I am working through in that moment is also part of that healing. So um, immediately I thought of like, that's an area and a place to heal in ourselves and in our inner child, our past experience so that we can like, like, what do we do as adults? We keep peeling layers so we can get back to ourselves again. So after all of this life stuff happens and we peel back just to get back to ourselves, our inner child. And sometimes I say to myself, I'm like, that's my inner five-year-old. I'm like going to be five years old right now. And I literally warn people before I even open my mouth. <laughs> I'm like, the inner child's coming out. Watch out. She's coming. <laughs> and like... So um, that's what came up for me, just adding on to some of the things that, yes, I, I agree with Becky, and I, I would add that. We talked about how you're a leader and, and your expertise is in leadership within communities. So what responsibilities do leaders within the community or the organization you know, have? What kind of responsibilities do they have to foster a culture of fellowship among the members? Like, you know, we say that that, that th when things aren't working, it kind of trickles down from the top. So let's go there as leadership within a community. You're, leader, you're a leader in many different communities. Uh, what kind of responsibility does, does, does it feel or does land on your shoulders for um, fostering that? It can be a great responsibility. Yeah, um, how do you manage it? Well, how do I manage it? Well, mm -hmm. I had a coach. I got a coach and I want to be a master of time. Mm -hmm. And I want to be like, I want to do all these great things. So I'm on the board of an organization to end mass incarceration in the United States. I am, you know, a social justice activist. I am an artist and I traveled through the American embassy to perform for a cultural exchange between Cuba and the U.S. Like um, there's so many parts of who I am and, and and I and I realized when I turned 40, I'm like, I'm not gonna be one thing. I wanna be all those things. And so I started to really harness being a master of time and the responsibility that it comes with it um, and the balance for rest so you don't burn out 
and the balance for a cadence of how are you tapping into your community? How are you creating a cadence that regularly taps into your community? Like it's a well-oiled machine and like I'm launching this webinar. And so I'm even looking at like, what does my cadence look like for being in community about what I'm out to cause? So um, those things come up for me and then being responsible and if I break my agreement to honor my agreement and stand in love and compassion and I had an amazing day yesterday with just standing in love and compassion everything moved so like even if there were disagreements or even if there were misunderstandings it was like I'm standing and coming from love and compassion and like this was my situation that was the other situation this is the outcome this is what got resolved and how can we move forward right so it's also about how you handle communication and how you're being in communication with people because when you drop out, it causes a gap. And then it causes not only loneliness for yourself, but loneliness with those others in our own community. Being able to listen and show up and be, you know, be quiet in the background, find out what other people's needs are before just blurting it out and talking. I know what you're talking about. Being standing in that love and compassion is so true. Um it, it allows us to tune into and become one with the environment so that we know which direction to go. But if we're always talking and we're not paying attention and listening with all of our senses, you know, seeing and hearing and being present with somebody, uh, I, I think communication can break down. That That's uh, that's a great perspective of that. You know, Becky, how does uh, fellowship contribute to personal growth and development when you're part of these different communities? What do you see? Oh, my gosh. Personal yeah. growth and development. <laughs> I mean, we're always learning from each other, right? Yeah. I mean, some of us is, are designed a little bit differently um, in how we go about doing that. But for somebody like me, um, I love hearing about other people's experiences. I love hearing about what it is that they learned. I loved hearing about how they sort of experimented with whatever <laughs> it is that we're happen to be in community and fellowship over. Like, so if it's like, if, if it's something that's around empowerment or something about just sort of like personal development, I love to hear about somebody else's journey and some of the things that they wrestled with and some of the sort of aha moments that they might have that could potentially serve me in some way. I think that when we really stop and listen and really allow ourselves to connect with other people, and to recognize that, you know, we're all beautiful, unique individuals having this collective human experience forever together. And everybody's experiencing it in a different way. Um, you you find, I don't know, it opens up something in yourself to really sort of look at your own experience a little bit more deeply um, to see like, oh, okay, like I kind of resonate with that story. I had a similar experience. And and what, what what did I take away from my experience? I'm hearing what they took away from ex their experience. What did I take away from my experience? And recognizing that both of those things are valid and it allows you to, for me to, I like to say save space for people, like to just really sort of be open to all sorts of things and really be in this place of discovery. Um, I love discovering, I love learning, I love growing, I love elevating. I'm somebody that doesn't believe in anything like titles like experts or <laughs> every time I hear the expert like on a title, I'm like, like there's always an expert on anything because there's always something new to learn. There's always a new avenue, a new direction to grow in. There's always, we're always in the state of elevation. And I think that once you look at yourself in that way and, and recognize that, you can learn from everybody around you um, and, and really sees that as an opportunity where I'm in a community of people. I want to learn from what everybody else, you know, learn for themselves. I want to benefit from their wisdom and their knowledge and their experience. And I want them to benefit from mine as well. I want to feed that as well with my own experiences. And and when we do that, something really sort of magical happens. Like, yeah. I, I feel like there's like this collective uplifting, like, you know, like, like yeah. we're just sort of like being lifted up together and we're elevating together in a really profound way that you can't do individually. So yeah. that's what it is. Rhiannon, what is it? Yeah, you made me think Rhiannon, about- Come on in. You made me think about 
just being with people and it doesn't matter about class or race or, you know, like all the distinctions that separate us from like, oh, that's not somebody, that's not somebody I'm going to talk to. Well, I'm going to tell you something, folks. I talk to the homeless people on the corner. I know them by name. I talk to who are on my block. I talk to, I talk to everybody. I'm not just sitting in a room talking with powerful people to make a difference for others. Like, it's about being able, can you be with the person that society told you was not somebody at all? Can you be with the person that somebody told you society was to reject? And when I tell you, when I'm in a prison and I'm talking to our guys who've been in for 20, 30 years for things like, you know, drugs that are legal right now, and they're still waiting to get out. And I forget I'm in a prison. I don't even notice I'm in a prison. I feel like I'm with human beings. And they're just like, oh my gosh, tell me more about aquaponics and hydroponics. Can you bring me books? And I'm like, I'm bringing books. And then I don't realize I'm in a prison until the gate closes behind me. And I'm like, I can't take you with me. What do you mean? <laughs> you know? Um, and and these most of them that we work with are men. And now we're working with more women and we're in eight prisons. So in New York State, and we have a national coalition and it's like, you know, we start to look at what does rehabilitation look like? What does being people look like? Are we going to really see people for who they are? Or are we going to just use the distinctions in which society has told us, you know, um, don't talk to that person because they're on the street and they're homeless, you know, and some of the most I have, I had a, I had a blog where it was New York City moments, hashtag New York City moments, where I just talked to New Yorkers, anybody. I met a mother and a daughter who were homeless. The mother had her job. The rent got raised. She had to move out of her house. They were waiting to get into the shelter at eight at night, just sitting and waiting. And I told her I was homeless when you when I was your age. And know that it doesn't last forever. Know that it, this is temporary, you know? And, and just like being able to like just exchange and be with people. And I think that our adversities are our blessings because it helps us actually connect, you know, um, to like, yes, we deserve food, clothing and shelter. Yes, that person is still human, even though they don't have access to the things that I have. Um, so it really makes me take I, I'm like putting this whole fellowship into overdrive, like outside of class, outside of comfort zones, outside of what we think is that human being, that which we were told. Yeah. You know what, Rhiannon, this is something that you reminded me of is that I always try to do and remember when I look at people. Because I'm at the grocery store and you look at these babies, right? You see these women carrying around these babies and they're like there and, and they're beautiful and they're innocent and they're so, they're looking at you with wide eyes and they're happy and you wave at them and they're like all so happy and they get all that attention and it's a really beautiful moment, right? And I remember that's all of us. It's all of us. We all started there. That's every that's single one of baby. us. That's somebody's baby, that person. That's somebody's baby, that innocence, that joy. That's where we started. And wherever we are now, you know, that has a lot to do with the life that we've led. That has a lot to do with the conditioning that we receive. That has a lot to do with outside factors. But if we can remember to just find that little baby in that person, in that human being that you're interacting with, I always try to see at least for a split second that little baby. And it brings me enough joy and enough light to know that whatever is, you know, my perceptions, whatever it is that um, my conditioning leads me to believe about a person or like those, those sort of like first instinctual judgments that you make, because we all make them. We're not proud of them. It doesn't mean they're valid, but they happen. And yeah. we have, you know, we have to acknowledge that, that they happen. And, and every time I sort of ping that, I try to see that baby picture that sort of checks me into place. And allows me to be like, okay, I don't know what life has done to this person. Um, I don't know what it is that they've been through. But at their core, that that little baby, I can't really see that that good, though. It's the blur effect. It's oh, the yeah. Blur effect. It's the <laughs> Wait, hold it back out closer to you, because then I can see it better. When it's closer yeah. to your face, I can sort of focus it on. There it is. Ah. There it is. Yeah. It's There's that baby picture. From cute, quiet, and shy to self-expressed and wildly adventurous. So claiming, claiming the inner child. I love that. I love it. You know, uh, I, I uh, opened it up unmuted in case Peter Swain wants to come in here and, and, and contribute to this question that I have. But how can technology and 
social media be used to enhance fellowship, especially in times when physical gatherings aren't possible? You know, some of us are spread out across the country, around the globe in our organization, but yet we still have those deep relationships, those deep connections. Some of my strongest friendships are with people that I've never actually met, which is just crazy in this time, in this world, the way that it is, is that we're we're physically not in the same room. I was recently meeting with a, um, a, a, a youth pastor, and he said that he took a bunch of eighth graders on a trip and he was observing and the boys are over here and the girls are over here. And he said, when I was an eighth grade man, I had been in the middle of that group. And he's like, I don't really understand all this behavior. And so he said, he asked one of the boys, he's like, you know, do you have a girlfriend? Do you have a crush on anybody? He, and, uh, and he said, you have a girlfriend. I've been talking to her this whole time. And, and he's like, I, you you haven't talked to anybody. He's like, yeah, we've been snapping and sharing photos and, and having this communication. And they're both there. And he's like, she's right over there. And he's like, the two have never crossed paths. How would anybody even know that they were boyfriend and girlfriend? So I'm, I'm, I'm leery with technology. Like we need to have human interaction, you know, babies who are never held or hugged you know, our failure to thrive, they need to be held and touched. And and we as adults, like Rhiannon said, you know, that inner child, that five-year-old is within us. How do we get held and touched and, um, you know, have that physical communication when we're reliant on technology and social media for so much of our fellowship and our relationships these days? I'd love for you guys to chime in on this. Who wants to go first? So I kind of want to say something about this. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm not saying you're wrong and I'm not saying you disagree, but I'm also saying that we are really quick to judge what kids are doing nowadays. And we're really sort of quick to judge these interactions and this forms of connection. I think for a lot of, especially young people and, 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 and adults too, I think we do this as well, that it's, it, there's something about that sort of distance that gives us a sense of security. It gives us a sense of being, um, it allows us to be more vulnerable. It allows us to feel safe because if, you know, if we're rejected in some way, if we're receiving negative attention in some way, if somehow who we are isn't received well, we can just press a button and have that sort of be erased. And we don't have to have that come into our face and our existence and our being and our energy field again. Um, we have a sense of control over that. And in that respect, it offers a sense of safety. Um, it offers us, um, you know, that control and, and we can somehow be a little bit more vulnerable, be a little bit more daring, be a little bit more putting ourselves out there in some capacity because we have control over, you know, interacting when you're doing, when you're having relationships with face-to-face, -face, especially with people at school, maybe they don't, they're not capable of seeing you fully. Maybe they're just, they're not the right energy. They're not the right vibe. And to have that sort of rejection when you're putting yourself out there and trying to make those friendships and trying to make those connections and being rejected and then having to see them every single day and being that energy, it can really be gut-wrenching. It can really be emotionally hard. And we are a society that hasn't really taught emotional health and well-being to our children or to each other. We don't have the vocabulary for our emotions. We don't have the sort of um, coaching and counseling and how to effectively deal with our emotions. Um, and especially during those teen years where you're sort of hormonal and like everything is sort of like going crazy and you don't feel like you have control over your body to also feel like you don't have control over who you're sharing your energy with and who is in your space and realm that could, it's a very frightening and terrifying thing. Um, so I like social media. I like sort of like this distance communication because I feel like it allows people to be themselves, the safe space to really be themselves, to be open and honest and vulnerable. And that's probably why, like you, a lot of my strongest relationships are people that I eventually seem to meet, but <laughs> initially I've never met before. Um, I think that this is an amazing opportunity as for people to connect in some way, because sometimes people don't want to connect on a personal level. They want to connect on some like, you know, I, I want to talk to other people that love D&D &D as much as me, or I want to talk to other people that just are really, really into Lord of the Rings or really like this TV series. 
um it's it's something that's non-personal but it's an it's something that lights you up and brings you joy and to be able to connect with other people that have that same sort of experience that might not be in your wheelhouse that might not be in your vicinity or people around you you might it gives you an opportunity to find those other people that get just as excited and in that shared excitement and in that exchange then you start to allow yourself to be seen and you allow yourself to be a little bit more vulnerable and have those sort of deeper friendships involved but you know, you're not always going to find people in your town, in your city, what have you, that share the same sort of interest that you have. So it really sort of opens it up to find those people that are just like you, that get just as excited and help you feel not alone and help you just really have a safe space to be yourself. I love that you said we get to turn it off. I've been uh, been turning off my phone from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. every day because it's like it's just too much that, you know, I'm I'm global, international and have people can, can call 24 hours a day. And I just had to create some boundaries around that. And same with social media. It's like I get to choose what I post and what I share and let people know what I'm up to and then turn it off. You know, we, it doesn't have to be be around the clock because it can be exhausting. And that's what our youth are being brought up with. And they have created boundaries and figured out how to have relationships using technology and still create that safe space so that they can turn it off and have that downtime. I love that. Um, Rihanna, what do you think about this? Technology yeah. help hurt? I, I think that it's both um, yeah. because we presently don't have regulations on it. Uh, policy wise to protect people, um, even from the entities themselves like Meta and such. Um, and it has caused injustice and division um, in realms when I speak from the social justice aspect of my work um, and me personally filing with the FCC um, that I was shadow banned. And so like I didn't have access to my 16,000 followers. Boom, just like that. And it was sharing something about mass incarceration, banned, sharing something. So so there are actual limitations and um and silencing tactics in these entities. And we also do have extreme bullying where if you turn it off, it won't help because the damage is done. And then it's everywhere people go. Um, and so people can get access to your address, be in front of your home. I've had instances where people stole money from social justice causes and the people are protesting in front of the wrong person's house because mm -hmm. that's the word that they got on Twitter. So I've been behind the scenes of some really hairy, large scale, high profile situations you know, one of which that led to me to even creating the entity that I have or are consulting to be able to transform the definition of leadership in these sectors, because whatever the definition is, it's definitely not this because it's not grounded in kindness. It's not grounded in like humanity. And going back to what we were saying, nobody teaches you what it means to be human when you're growing up. No one teaches you the hangups about being human being, like your programming, um, how to override it. Um, and, and like, oh, like my act is like, I can do this all by myself is my act because as a child, I was taught that no one's going to help you and figure it out on your own and how I'm unlearning that through my adult life and unlearning layers of that through my adult life and actually trying to get myself to believe that people allowing people to be there for you is allowing them to love you. Um, and that was like a deep form of worthiness and allowing love. Like if I'm worthy of love, I need to allow love, right? So, um, but if we don't know our human conditions, how can we understand ourselves, therefore understand someone else and be like, oh, that's not me. That's that's a trigger. That's something, that's how they're reacting to X happening. And this is what it means to them. And to not take anything personal because being human, more often than not, don't take anything personal. It has nothing to do with you. It's coming from another space. It's coming from a subconscious space. Um, and, you know, I worry about my daughter. She's 14, for example, and she's on social media and her ability to connect with the world outside of a screen and the Internet. There's a whole world in her screen. There's a whole world there. And I am present to that. And I ask her to be present to the world out here. 
So yeah. we've been limiting that. So like, I feel our generation can put it down and walk away. That's not the case with my daughter. Like she's even had a girlfriend or boyfriend online. And I'm like, excuse me, you're too young for that. And that's not a relationship. And I would love for your relationships, your first relationships to actually be physically in person. And so she's had a couple of those, but it's still um, daunting. And I have met people online that are like my brothers. I have a friend in Germany who's from South Africa. We met once at a party and we've been in touch for seven years. And that is my bro. Like we are FaceTiming with my partner. We're laughing and joking. And like when he had surgery and he was laying on his stomach during the pandemic and I'm just like, you're still assuming the position. And he's just like, stop it. <laughs> and, and I was his company when he was in complete isolation alone. And like, you know, um, that's also the power of it. So there's a power in it. And then there also is a, disservice in it and an oppression in it be like whatever we as human beings believe to use something as that's the tool and how we use it um and so yeah that's what i think about that and that's why we come into conversation that's why we have these discussions and ask the questions so that we can get a different perspective maybe it's something we've triggered something that a mom or a dad hasn't thought about and you both sharing your perspectives on it will open the door for them to have a conversation with their kids. So thank you for being vulnerable. Yes, uh, you know, both of you very vulnerable and sharing what it is that you know about fellowship and friendship. I, I want I want to kind of define the difference between fellowship and friendship. And then I want to give you each a chance to tell people how they can connect with you. Um, is there a difference between fellowship and friendship in your opinion? Go ahead, Becky, you're shaking your head. Yeah, I, I I think that friendship is just sort of like the, it's just the deepened sort of connection and engagement that you take like beyond fellowship. Um, yeah. When you really sort of make it a point to, you might be interacting with lots of groups of people, you might be, um, you know, in fellowship communication, but with with a, a variety of different people but when you find like there's there's certain people that will speak to you there's certain people that you just either you feel um you know some sort of deep connection some sort of symbiotic relationship with and you just sort of make it a little bit more personal of a relationship um maybe you decide that you know i'm gonna open myself up more vulnerability wise to this particular person and let them in or maybe there's for me, it's, it usually starts off with this, this opportunity where, you know, I, my skill set and, and what I have and, you know, what I've been blessed with, with my, in my life, the lessons that I've been blessed with to learn in my life can really be a benefit for this person. And it can really, I feel like it can help them in some capacity, whatever, with whatever it is that they're struggling with. Those are the types of people that I reach out to in a personal way and, and I want to help them. I want to see them shine. I want to elevate them. I want them to achieve success. And so I will make it a point to have a little bit more of a personal relationship with them, a little bit more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And those develop into quite beautiful friendships. You know, I look at Rhiannon and, you know, part of my friendship with Rhiannon was, you know, the, the first moment that I was introduced to her energy um, there was just sort of like this moment within me is like her. And and I don't question that because that has never led me wrong. And so it's like her. And I think I reached out to you and I was like, hey, we're supposed to be friends. <laughs> and we are. Now are, we yeah. are. Like, yeah. You know, like, um, and she was in New York City and we tried to meet up and, you know, it just, then we ended up just FaceTiming as if we were like there, but... <laughs> Um, it was just like wild, um, you know, and I look forward to either getting out there to visit you or even like when you come back, finally linking up. Um, it's funny, everybody who comes to visit, even Peter gets sick and then I can't see each other. <laughs> yeah. My, most Shit versus vacation. fellowship. Rhiannon, do you have a, do you have some final words on that? Friendship versus fellowship. Um, I... I honestly am an, an authentic person and I, I feel camaraderie or, or, or friendship or, or like a, a human family connection with anyone that I cross paths with and work with, like that I work with on projects that I work with, like I'm on this 
call with you ladies right now. And it's like, I, I consider you my friends. Like we've already been through some stuff together and we've picked up the phone and called each other. Like both of our fathers were transitioning at the same time, Lisa, yeah. and to have each other to like, just say, yeah, I get it. And mm -hmm. someone got it. Um, and we were, you know, and like, no, this is not supposed to be happening alone. Like, where's the village? Oh, we have to generate the village. We have to call the village, you know? Um, and so many of those moments are what create that trust and that love and build it. You know, and then people who aren't in alignment with that, they show you who they are. And when they show you who they are, believe them. And, you know, some people's purpose are, you know, money and that's it. There's nothing else, you know, they're capitalists. That's it. Um, and, and it's okay, accept it. And then, um, you know, some of those people aren't my people. So, um, and I've learned to accept that not everybody is going to be your people and not everybody's going to like you and that's going to be okay. And I found myself in my forties. I'm like, I love my forties. I'm like, okay, thank you. No, thank you. Let people go who want to go and let people stay who want to stay. Yeah. We can be in fellowship with people, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to build friendships, but it's important to have all the diversity that we can in those organizations, having fellowship with them so that we can see other people's perspective because of the growth and the contribution that it creates. So fellowship is important, but get into those deeper relationships, be vulnerable, let your humanness come out so that you can create those deep soul felt yeah. heart connections with folks. And I will uh, add... Yeah, go ahead. I just want to add one more thing. It's like also that vulnerability is so valuable because like had I not shared what I was going through, I wouldn't even have the team that I have right now that's behind me launching what I'm launching. Had I not shared, this is what the world of what I'm going through and people got it. And it wasn't like, I'm not judging you for the circumstance. I see you and we're going to make this thing rock. And I got your back. And, and you know, that right there is golden. Yeah. Speaking of which, you're launching something. I'd love it for you to share the audience and tell people how they can yes. get connected to you. And then we'll have Becky. Um, so I just shared in the chat um, Aurora Consulting's uh, website, and I have a passive income webinar tonight for nonprofits, um, how to get passive income in 60 to 90 days. And so if you're curious about that, there's a link for the Eventbrite um, tonight at 7 and or you can go to the website and book a one-on-one -on -one and be able to get the world of what that is um, personally. So the website you. is Call Aurora, that's C-A-L-L-A-U-R-O-R-A.com. And this it's you do have one tonight, but these are ongoing. So if this is yeah. something that you're looking for is passive income, uh, learn how to get yourself set up with some passive income. Rhiannon works heavily with the nonprofit organizations around the globe, not just throughout the U.S. So wherever you are tuning into, wherever you are listening to this, um, please check out her website and get connected with Rhiannon Murphy. Again, that that website is C-A-L-L-A-U-R-O-R-A, -L -L -A -A, callaurora.com. And Miss Becky Sheehan, where do people find you? Um, they can find me at uh, beckysheehan.com. And, you know, I help, I coach and, and do human design work. So if you're somebody who has, you know, really lost touch with who you are, or you struggle with your own, with vulnerability, of really allowing yourself to be your most authentic self in any given situation. You know, human design is an amazingly powerful tool that is a roadmap into who you were designed and created to be in this life experience. And it is an empowering tool. It is an accurate tool. And I love working with people to really help them find themselves and to celebrate who they are and created to be in this world so that they can live a truly beautiful and authentic life. Um, I'm also doing, I'm in the middle of a certification program where um, I'm becoming through the lens of human design, a uh, certified family coach. And one of the things that we do, Rhiannon, in this program is we teach families and children really about who they are, who they were created to be, what it is to be human and give allowances for themselves and to be that sort of create that sort of family structure that really celebrates it and empowers their kids to live authentically, to be fully who they are and how to interact with other people and to provide the grace and space with other people and different energies to for them to be 
who they fully and truly are. So it's a really beautiful program. I'm really excited to share in a few months and offer that as part of my offerings. So BeckySheen.com. Love it. Yeah. So uh, great conversation, ladies. Thank you so much for your time and uh, for being vulnerable and letting folks know kind of how you show up in the world and how you uh, invite other people into the world that you share. And for those of you that are interested in joining our, it's called the Morning Rush, the Morning Rush group, uh, you can reach out to me. There'll be a link in the show notes. And then you can also search for it on any of your social media places to find the Morning Rush. And that's our morning community that meets Mondays, Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Eastern, all are welcome. And if you need to get into community, just listen in or find people, amazing, extraordinary, brilliant people like we've had today on our show. Um, that's where I would direct you to. My name is Lisa Mosby. I'm the host of Living with Favor. And if you could use a bit of advice to start or expand your business using social media, let's discuss your business today. You can go over to Lisa Mosby, M-O-S-B-E-Y, lisamosby.com and book a 30 minute call with me. And we can dig deeper into what it is that you're wanting to do in your world. Uh, as an entrepreneur. So thanks again, everybody. Uh, appreciate you being here. We'll see you next week. Come on back.